Hello again, I am Jim Bob and welcome back to Lone Oak Farm. As you can see, we are loading up the old combines. Getting these uh, put onto the back of these trailers, ready to be taken away by case. They turned up around about 20 minutes ago. All the paperwork has already been signed. And uh, we now completely officially own the 7130. We've had to pay for it. And we've had to pay for the header as well. Obviously, they threw in the trailer for free for us as a kind of a a special for a special deal for signing and buying on the day. There we go. So our two combines are loaded up and uh, ready to be taken away. In case it's going to give them a quick uh, strap down, make sure that they're all ready. Uh, while they're doing that. Our combine is, our new combine is here as you can see. Left it in the workshop overnight because I wanted to clear the bay. Make sure that we had uh, plenty of space for this thing to go into. So let's uh, maneuver this into its new home. Can I make this turn? Ooh, just, yeah. Uh, so this is now going to sit uh, just here where our two 1660s did sit and take pride of place just here. It's still got that smaller header there as you can see. Wanted to keep one of those just for when we move on to some of the smaller fields and we have some access issues with tight gates and things like that. I figured having a smaller header for small fields might be more useful than actually just keeping hold of a small combine just for the occasional field. That should hopefully still be able to fit through. It's not that much wider than a 1660. Uh, and then obviously with that header we'll be fine. Uh, when it comes to getting a, uh, a larger corn header we can get one that actually folds up so we won't have to worry about you know, that sticking out either side either. That'll fold in, in on itself and be the same width as our combine. So it's all good. Uh, it's uh, an exciting time ahead. We've still got uh, crop that needs to be harvested this year. We pull up some information about the farm just here on the computer. Let's have a look. So you can see now our soybean has finally grown. This is all now ready to go, as is our corn as well. Our corn is also ready to go. So our remaining five fields are now ready. Plus, don't forget, we also need to do some grass work over here. Uh, pretty soon, we'll need to do some grass work over here. And it's possible we might actually need to go and weed this field a second time today. As you can see, that's at stage two. It needs one more application with the weeder. Uh, and we also need to deal with these fields and start prepping these for next year as well. So I want to try and get some slurry uh, spread on this field today. We were hoping to do that yesterday and just ran out of time. Uh, and then uh, we might do slurry on this field as well if we have time. So uh, general plan of action today is uh, to make a start on some of this soybean work. Uh, but we're also going to be doing something a little bit different. Don't forget our specialty item uh, arrives on the farm today. It's due within the next couple of hours, just waiting for final confirmation, but that should be with us very, very soon. So looking forward to getting my hands on that and unveiling that to you. But I think it's time for us to uh, say a fond farewell to our two 1660s that we uh, inherited when we had this farm. They've served us well, but time is uh, right for us to sort of move on and uh, upgrade to a larger combine.
Okay, so there you go, the combines. They are gone. We have finally got rid of those, and uh, all the money has now been kind of moved around and transferred. So if we take a look at our financials, you can see we have a loan debt now of 275000 uh, The total money we made yesterday from selling off the straw bales and the silage bales, you can see there's the trailer that we kept. Uh, the straw bales and the silage bales and the sunflowers that we sold yesterday brought in around 267,000 or so uh, and then obviously we gained an extra couple of hundred thousand uh, from the combines but we had to sell uh, you know spend 330,000 to actually buy this one and the header so it's all shaken out to putting us at around about 275,000 debt now that is actually going to jump up again <laughs> quite substantially a little later today as the rest of our equipment turns up but uh, let's start putting some stuff to work so I want to uh, unleash the combine on our soybean fields today or at least on one of them we have good weather if we just take a look at the radar you can see we've got good weather today we've got good weather scheduled for tomorrow and potentially you know good harvesting weather for the day after that as well so we do have you know a nice little window here and if we take a look at the seasons menu you can see that wheat barley and canola are now out of their harvest window so if we had any of those crops left now they'd be withered right now if we hadn't harvested them so yesterday was the final day that we could actually get that barley done if we hadn't done it yesterday it would be a dead crop today so that's now been taken care of and you can see we're sort of approaching the halfway point of our window for us you know for sunflowers soybeans corns potatoes beets so on and so forth now we have soybean and we have corn and we are in the harvest window so we're looking pretty good in that respect We've got plenty of time left. We've got to basically to the end of autumn to bring these crops in. And as you can see, we've got good weather today and tomorrow and potentially day five as well. Day six, we've got some rain forecast. And depending on when that falls and how heavy it falls, that could completely ruin that day if there's still any crop that needs to be harvested. I'm expecting us to be able to pull all of this crop in um, on this field and one of the other fields maybe today. Uh, and I also have some other stuff that I want to get done as well. So we've got some options. We've got some time to get things done. You know, we're, we're not in a mad panic. You know, the way that we've been able to sort of stagger our crops has been very helpful to us. You know, we haven't been caught unawares with anything particularly, you know, nasty or problematic. You know, we're looking to be in a very healthy position today. So uh, because we're going to be sort of working potentially a fair way away from the silo certainly I think a little too far away for us to uh, make regular trips back with the auger we're actually going to run the truck today uh, I've gone the wrong way the auger's just over there uh, we're going to run the truck today have that parked up and we'll uh, we'll be tipping our auger into the trailer uh, I am making inquiries to get a larger trailer over winter so that we can uh, increase our sort of transport capacity for not just for crops to a sell point but also from crops you know for crops from a field to the silo as well just so we can kind of speed things up in that respect and hopefully that'll all uh, come together quite nicely for us in winter time whoops mm. nearly backed into our soybean there Let's try and weave my way through here I've just realized I'm just kind of damaging the edge of this grass field but it's not a major issue it's only rolling it back a little bit and it's just a tiny bit that's getting rolled back let's go grab the header that's obviously the most important thing <laughs> when it comes to using a harvester is to have something to actually be able to take take that harvest you know off the field and that would be this header so this soybean should be so much easier and faster to harvest now now that we only have the one combine and we're saving money as well we paid out a lot of money to buy it but in the long run it's going to be better for us because the maintenance cost for this combine is going to be cheaper than the combined maintenance cost of the other two combines so we're paying less each day in terms of maintenance and uh, vehicle expenditure uh, we're paying less in terms of wages because we're only needing to run one worker to run this combine rather than two workers to run both of the other combines And it has a faster, you know, uh, wider working width. So we're harvesting faster 
as well so it's taking less time so again we're paying less in wages so we really are benefiting quite substantially by having made this you know initial outlay it's cost us as i say about a hundred grand in terms of an outlay thanks to the party exchange as opposed to the full 330 plus that it could have cost us but you know it's it's going to save us you know a, a ton of money in the long run so it's all going to shake out quite nicely over the next season or the next year or two to the point where we will actually potentially be turning a profit in the deal so let's get in and start attacking this field now this field is a very odd shape you know this is a genuinely sh you know this field is shaped genuinely like this on the real world location for lone oak uh, it is you know kind of a strange one you can see it runs around these trees here goes into that little alcove down there by the by the little pond slash lake i suppose it's a bit too big to be a lake a bit too small maybe to be a pond um i don't know depends on your definition of pond i suppose um but it does kind of snake around here and then we've got that little bit of forest area in the middle there and it snakes up and around and then back down again on the other side of that and it's completely genuine that is exactly how that field is shaped in reality so uh, definitely an authentic kind of feel to it this field even if it is as i say a little bit stranger a little bit difficult to work in places this is genuinely how this field is shaped and it leaves me wondering how exactly to to work this field whether to go up and down which would be you know the logical option or whether to go side to side for the top bit and then you know kind of do that and then turn this into a small square block and work the square block afterwards and i think the easiest way for me to do this is just going to be to work this going up and down and then uh same on the other side of the forest go up and down work with the fiddly bits where it gets a little bit strange in its shape and then go side to side across that little sort of joining section in the middle there I think that's probably how I'm going to work this field. So for now, I just want to concentrate on creating a, a reasonably good, nice sort of uh, stable border for us to work within. We're going to work this section of the field first, you know, this uh, large section here. So we're going to go up here a little bit and uh, well, as we get towards the lone oak, which I haven't actually seen the lone oak with autumn shading on yet. You can see obviously we've got some of these trees now we're starting to get some some nice color into these trees i have yet to see the lone oak at autumn time uh, i can just see there's some tinges of orange and brown in there and i'm looking forward to when we get closer and that tree comes into a sharper focus i'm really looking forward to seeing exactly what that tree looks like uh, but yeah our uh, our farm mascot so to speak is undergoing some changes as you can see really am looking forward to, to uh, getting a nice close-up shot it's starting to get into a sharper detail now as you can see and it actually does look really good again it's quite hard to tell because the sun is behind it or the light is shining from the other side of the tree and so it's all in shade on this side you can see the shadow there look coming down across the field just to our left so I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump out for a second here I just want to have a closer look at this tree from the other side if we wade into our field a little bit Oh, that looks awesome, doesn't it? There is our uh, autumn lone oak. Very, very nice. Right. Uh, we need to make sure we have headlands on this field because, as you can see, we are very close to other fields. And the last thing I want is the combine driving into the fields or by or us by mistake when we have manual control of this. So... Uh, put a headland in along the top here give us that little bit of extra turning room and then we're going to run up and down the field that way there I'll probably square off the bottom a little bit as well so it's a nice straight sort of rectangular piece of uh, piece of ground for us to work we'll take the, uh, the top sections off the bottom well I'd say the top section we'll take those those extended sections off the bottom of the field and just have a nice straight line running across uh, just to make it again a little bit easier for our AI worker 
So you can see we've cleared away this whole bottom section here. Got a nice, clean, smooth edge running along this field now. So all that remains is to engage the combine and get that up and running. I have had to unload it once already. So we do have a little bit of grain in the back of the auger. Uh, but now I'm going to go get the truck and uh, get that parked up because our new item will be arriving any moment. Yeah, here is our big mystery item. We now have a uh, Rostel Mash forage harvester on our farm as well. I realized that we had, you know, all this corn that was sitting there doing absolutely nothing and, you know, we could harvest it, but we'd need to buy a proper header for it. And, and I thought, you know, we're looking at getting into cows. We kind of need to do some chaff work. Why not get ourselves a forage harvester? Now, Rostel Mash isn't sold from a main dealer in the United States. It does have to be imported. But luckily enough, there was actually uh, uh, a model that was uh, sort of a couple of states out that uh, was a cancelled order. Someone had a change of heart at the last moment. And so this was sort of uh, about to be kind of shipped back overseas but we managed to jump in and purchase this. So it's taken a couple of days for that to arrive by road, as you can see, but we now have a Rostel Mash forage harvester. And the reason I went for one of these is simply because <laughs> they're cheap. <laughs> 220,000 or so for the actual forage harvester itself, another sort of 20, 30,000 for the header. Uh, much, you know, much yeah, by far, the, you know, the cheapest option available to us on the market. And uh, we are gonna need, you know, something like this to do uh, a lot of forage work in the future so it just made sense for us to again because I don't want to drown our farm in debt and I do want to try and expand and acquire some new land over winter if at all possible it made sense for us to, tr to truly kind of watch the pennies and the and uh, and buy something that wasn't going to bankrupt us so there we go uh, our new item is here and if we get a little bit of time we might do some of that today but more more than likely we'll be breaking out our new uh, forage harvester tomorrow now this is our big money crop this soybean here now we're going to kind of use some of this as a, a bargaining tool so to speak as a as a proof of future payment we're going to be purchasing some land and it's going to put us quite heavily into debt over the winter uh, but we will be kind of borrowing against this crop now next summer is going to be the best time to sell our soybeans you can see there we get a phenomenally high price at the beginning of summer and then it's pretty low pretty much throughout the rest of the year so uh, come winter time we'll be looking at some new lands looking where we can acquire some additional fields and we'll have to spend money that we don't necessarily have, you know, go into debt with the, with the bank a little bit. Uh, and our, uh, our grain haul here will kind of be acting as collateral. So the more we can take off these fields here, obviously we've got this field here, uh, we've got our massive field there by the Lone Oak, and then we've got that big field over there as well. The, uh, the volume of soybean will determine just how much we've got to kind of play about with. This will determine how much we can potentially lend against the value of a potential, you know, high value sale in the summer. Now we do only have, you know, a couple of sell points. So we've got to be careful with the timing and the price when we do sell, and not over overestimate just how much this crop is going to be worth next summer, but we can use it as a fair estimate. And as I say, if we get a large quantity, then that will really help 
expand the farm in the short term and then pay that off again in the summer next year once we finally sell this crop at market so it's it's going to be interesting to see just how much we do get off the fields and then when it gets to winter and we don't have much work to do on the farm that's when we're looking at uh, maybe swapping out some equipment and definitely looking at expanding the farm and adding in some additional land So now it's time to sort of start prepping to work our, uh, our digestate into the ground. We're going to be putting some slurry on. So uh, the boys are going to put some uh, twin wheels on this. We're going to switch over and start using the Puma to pull the auger. And our Magnum is going to be running our slurry spreader with the uh, front tank as well. And that is going to be sort of loading everything onto the field and uh, injecting that slurry in there for us. So one other thing I need to do, I'm gonna quickly do that now, is uh, just get on the phone to uh, the BGA and order up some digestate to be delivered down here for us. So uh, I'll get, on, get onto that right now. So the tank is on the way. That should be with us very, very soon. The uh, the boys are fitting twin wheels in the workshop on the Magnum. We'll get that hooked up to the slurry equipment in just a moment. And we need to tag our combine for another unload, as you can see. Plenty of turning space, thanks to that headland that we put in. We need to make sure we do that across you know, the top of the field as well, all the way along. set cruise control here on the Puma there we go so it's all starting to come together quite nicely we've got our combine running we've got a, a our, uh, delivery system set up here for the grain see the trucks parked up over there uh, another couple of tips and uh, that'll be ready to go to the silo uh, we've got our Magnum being fitted for uh, for new wheels. We've got slurry and digestate on the way. We're going to start uh, fertilizing that field. It's all coming together very nicely. All right, so here we are in our freshly decked out dual tired Magnum. Let's get the front tank hooked up first of all. And now the rear tank. There we go. And make our way out. The uh, The truck has arrived. It's parked up along the edge of our uh, sunflower field there, as you can see. So we're going to go and uh, start filling up from that. And then we'll run manually a couple of widths on the field to create uh, the border that we need. And then we'll get the worker to do everything else. So let's start the fill. There goes the front tank. I wonder if I can pull forward and get the second tank at the same time. No, I have to refill near the rear. There we go. About halfway along, it seems to be our cutout point. And there you can see Mets Digestate Services sent to us from Gavco, the BGA. 3,000 litres in the front tank. Let's get the rear tank full. And then uh, we'll start spreading our slurry across the field. So we know that the AI does not like coming up to the edge of this field because of this dirt path. So what we're going to do is a couple of passes manually along here. This is why we needed to have some slurry in the tank so that we can actually apply this manually. And you can see it goes down at a pretty quick rate, even though we don't have the, the widest working width. 
We don't have a massive capacity with this particular spreader and even with an extra 3,000 litres from having this, uh, uh, this Goma front tank, you know, one of the more recent mods that we've had, it's still not a particularly fast capacity. We've already used up 2,000 litres just in that short little stretch from the edge of the field to where we are now and we're not even halfway across the field yet. So you can imagine just how often we'd be running out of slurry if we were to try and manually refill this every time. Now the transport truck has brought 40,000 litres with it. We've used nearly half of that just to, uh, just to fill the gear up that we have now so we can do this little manual bit. And it's not going to take long, as I say, for this to run out. That's 4,000 litres used up. We're down to 75%, 74. So we've used a quarter of the tank just doing not even one width across the field. And when you look at the size of the field, you know, you can see just how often we've been running out. Now we should have more than enough digestate to actually cover this entire field, man, you know, you know, from start to finish. However, we're not gonna have enough time <laughs> to do this manually because as you know, I like to run at times five. Oops, damaging the crop a little bit there. I like to run at times five to kind of create that uh, sort of illusion of uh, time on a scale that seems a little bit more realistic. Because, you know, otherwise it would just be, you know, able to work, you know, being able to work this, the land as quick as we are, if we did this on real time, we'd have nothing to do after like the second day of each season we'd be completely done on, on everything. All of our jobs would be done, so... Then we'd be sort of stuck at the mercy of we need to do a... a quick fertiliser run on one of my fields and that would take maybe an hour to get all my fields done or a couple of hours and then what do we do for the rest of the day? So I like to play at times five to kind of balance that out so that we always have something to do each day. The jobs that we pick will usually take the whole day and then the next day we still have jobs to do and then the next day still have jobs and so on and so forth. We never have significant downtime. Now that's going to change at winter because I'm not planning on doing much in the way, if any, of you know, in the way of logging on this map. So we might not have much to do at winter. In winter we might kind of skip through a little bit. We'll have little bits here where we do stuff where we go to market and sell some stuff or maybe you know, go and do some land deals somewhere, but by and large, winter is going to be a very short process. We're going to be skipping through a lot of winter straight to the spring again. Oh, it looks like our combine has finished harvesting that first section of field, but the, as I say, the sheer amount of time it would take us to, to use up 40,000 litres, which, as you can see, we've only got 7,000 litres left on board now, uh, so that's nearly half of all the digestate we brought with us used up nearly half to do a couple of passes and then run out and have to go back to the BGA and fill up and then come all the way back here and then do two passes and then go all the way back it would take the entire day to do this field so instead what we're going to do I've just realized we're running at six miles an hour that's probably going to slow down <laughs> or use up a little bit more slurry than we should be using up as well. What we're going to do is instead we're going to get the worker to do this field for us. So now that we've got that border out of the way and the AI can run up and down this field, what we're going to do is get him lined up. We're going to go into our options, our game settings, and we're going to change our slurry to buy from the digestate tank. So all the, t the digestate that we currently have in that tank will now automatically refill this and when the tank at the BGA runs dry then if we still have work to do we'll be reliant on whatever's left in the equipment that we have here plus whatever's left in the tanker there but this way we should get all of this field done and we don't have to stop every pass and a half to two passes to refill and then every couple of runs of doing that to then go back to the digestate, uh, digestate tank at the BGA fill up there come back here and uh, and just it would take so long to do anything like that so by doing it like this we can now kind of skip away I'm just going to follow him along a little bit until we get past this next telegraph pole because sometimes the AI doesn't like getting too close to the telegraph poles and will stop and turn around hopefully he'll be alright on this looks like he's going to be fine 
But yeah, there we go. We are finally putting Digestate into the ground. And the AI is going to do it all for us and we don't have to worry about anything at all. So, uh, all looking very good so far. And now we can concentrate on the harvest. So as you can see, this section is cleared. So now we've got this kind of weird, awkward bit here, this little middle bit around these trees. And I suppose we could possibly cut down a couple of trees to try and level things off a bit, but I love the aesthetic of this map, and I don't want to ruin that by deforesting large sections of the map. A, as I say, I don't like doing large-scale logging because it takes so long to do, and... You know, you end up just completely changing the aesthetic of the map. And part of these, you know, part of the character of this map is the way that the woodlands are set out. And the last thing I want to do is rip half of those woodlands out and completely ruin what I think is a, is a, a wonderful aesthetic to this map, is having these forested areas like this. So I won't be doing large deforestation runs around this farm at all, because it's just not something I think would would work very well for this map. I think it would actually ruin the look of the map. And I don't want to start messing around with that. But, you know, we could take out the odd tree here and there where we need to. And, and sure, I'm sure at some point we will have to chop down a couple of trees just for the sake of being able to move equipment around or store equipment or maybe build a new storage building somewhere because we just don't have enough space wherever we need to. And I'm looking at the sheep farm in particular as uh, an, an example there where we may well need to do a little bit of trimming here and there just to restructure things ever so slightly but for the most part I, as I say I have absolutely zero intention of messing around with uh, cutting down trees and, and removing bushes and, and, and things with, with chainsaws and, and uh, stump grinders and so on and so forth so we're going to leave the natural beauty of this map intact because I think you know it deserves it I don't think it uh, I don't think it, it would do the map justice to start chopping down large sections of it with a with a Scorpion King and and ripping out you know huge great big open plains where there was a wonderful little forest somewhere. We've got plenty of land on this map, as you can see. We've got you know over 50 fields, so it's not like we're pushed for for space or choice when it comes to where we're going to work. It's not like we need to go out and make some big custom field somewhere because we just don't you know we've got so much land that we that we can work with already on this map we it doesn't need us messing around with the uh, the design layout and uh, and changing anything So we're getting close to getting, uh, I say, nearly a full trailer's worth of uh, soybean in the back of uh, our truck here. We might actually possibly, possibly fill up. Oh, it's going to be close. I mean, we've got a 47,000 litre capacity. There's a little bit left in the auger, as you can see. Well, that's as close as as, as maybe to, to absolutely full. So let's go drop this off. This is our first full trailer, our first delivery of, of soybean to the silo. Let's see when we get there just how much we've got in storage already so we know roughly how much we're going to be able to pull off the field or oh, all the fields in total so I'll make the uh, little turn to our yard here it's quite tight in places this yard I'm quite open in others I suppose it depends on what route you want to take so before we tip this in there we go Let's see just how much we have in storage. So we currently have seven and a half thousand liters of soybeans. Okay, so that's what we need to take off at the end. Once we've finished all of our soybean fields and see just how much crop we're looking at. The price actually, what is the price at the moment? Uh, see, the price isn't great. It's only 1,200. You know, uh, that's pretty low. And if you look there... It's slightly above the prediction there. I'm not expecting us to get three and a half thousand or so 
next summer. But I am expecting us to get around two and a half thousand, you know, around that kind of mark. If we can get towards three, that'll be nice. But I'm expecting more in the region of around two to two and a half thousand liters uh, as the price for our soybean. So if we can get a hundred thousand liters of soybean. That in itself, well, we're going to get more than that. I can guarantee we're going to get more than 100,000 litres. But 100,000 litres uh, at 2,500 litres per thousand is a quarter of a million in terms of income. It's a quarter of a million dollars. So if we can get double that, if we can get 200,000 litres of soybean across all of our fields, which I think is easily doable, then we're looking at half a million potentially in, in money next summer. This is why it's so important for us to, uh, you know, to kind of try and figure out exactly how much soybean we're going to get off our fields, and then use that as collateral against purchases in the summer. Now we currently have a little over half a million dollars of debt on the farm thanks to purchasing our our new uh, corn chaffer. So we have five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars of debt. Uh, and then obviously we've got a little bit of cash on hand. I've got four and a half grand or so on hand. So a little bit of operating money, but not a lot. Uh, and then a lot of debt. Now that's going to get reduced before uh, the end of the year, hopefully, with uh, more silage runs. We've got the chance to do some more silage baling. Let's just switch into the harvester. This is the other great thing about having... Uh, pressing the wrong button. There we go fire the worker, I kept jumping out instead of firing the worker, is the fact that I'm able to really run manually on this combine a lot more because it takes longer for the AI to get involved. So I get to do more manual combining like this. It's not constantly filling up all the time, so I don't have to worry about just plonking a, an auger in place and let the grain automatically get emptied and go off and do other things. I can actually get involved a bit more with the harvest with this combine because it has that larger tank and with a, a low yield crop like this you know it takes a longer longer time for the tank to actually fill up so it's a win-win in that situation but uh, I've kind of lost the train of thought I was saying now yeah I mean the sheer amount of money that we, we currently owe is a lot you know half a million we're going to reduce it down with some more silage baling, but at the same time, we're also going to be adding to the debt at the same time with with livestock. Yeah, I'm going to take a trip once this field itself is finished. We're going to take a trip, you know, over the lunch break, over to the livestock market, and we're going to try and have a look at some cattle uh, with a view to bringing that over uh, in the next day or two. Probably tomorrow, if we can actually find some good priced cattle, we might place a pre-order today and then purchase those tomorrow or we might purchase them today to be delivered tomorrow we'll have to see how that goes we still need to find a mixer now I've been uh, speaking to some of the uh, the locals in the area and they have suggested that you know someone has got you know a mixer they would be willing to loan us until we could afford to uh, you know to buy one ourselves so we could look at you know uh, you know paying a small sort of uh, lease fee with a local farmer and borrowing a mixer we just basically all we need to do is we need to mix up enough TMR just to get them through to the beginning of the year or just to get them through the next few days and then that gives us a bit more time for us to actually get in there and buy our own silage mixer so we've got the increase in costs coming from buying a mixer uh, we've got the cost of the cattle itself, so the silage baling that we're going to do to finish the year off is probably just about going to cover those costs, and that's it. And we can't do as many silage bales as we did before for two reasons. One, we need to use some of that grass to make hay, and two, uh, we just don't have as many bales <laughs> available to us because we've got some straw bales in storage now, and we're going to have some hay bales in storage and we already have some silage bales here at the farm in storage as well so whereas before we could make you know close to 200 bales before we hit the limit now we can only make maybe 100 bales at most before we hit the limit because of you know other bale requirements that we're going to need so it limits how much silage we can make per session and we don't have a lot of time left before the grass is going to start dying off you know come winter that grass is going to start you know dying off and disappearing so 
we've got to really get on it in the next couple of days in terms of our mowing now the hay work's probably going to have to get done tomorrow while we have the good weather uh, can't do any kind of hay work when it's wet because it'll take too long for the grass to dry out before we can tet it and by the time it has dried out half of it will have rotted away anyway so we kind of need to make the hay pretty much as soon as it's being cut and the other problem that we have as I say is uh, just trying to make sure that we we can get all of that done including the rest of our harvesting in the next two days really before the bad weather starts setting in so we are a little pushed for time but we've still got enough time to get things done if we're careful and we're clever with how we do things so it's going to be a very interesting couple of days I think if we just take a quick look at the progress our uh, magnum is making putting down the slurry still going strong you can see obviously because we're still buying from the digestate tank the level in our actual joskin tank is not going down that's why that's a static level because uh, we're taking and filling directly from the BGA there is that backup tank just over there with a little bit more in, in case we do run out and what I'll do at the end is assuming we can get everything done without needing to resort to a refill uh, is I'll, uh, I'll just use what's left in that tanker to top up these bits of equipment a little bit so that we still have a little bit on hand here at the farm if we need it for anything uh, but yeah making good progress and uh, we are two-thirds of the way through the field nearly three-quarters of the way through the field I would say actually especially when you add in that uh, headland that we did at the top there so this field not far from being done now And that is the end of the first field. That is all of the soybean from uh, field 45 harvested and uh, collected. So that's it now. We're going to break for lunch. We'll get the workers to uh, have a nice little break. And then we'll start attacking this big field here, field 49. That'll be uh, their job for the afternoon. So we'll just drop this in. You can see we've got uh, around 12,000 litres in here. So you combine that with the 47 or so that we had originally, that's, um, that's nearly 60,000 litres just off this field alone. That's a pretty decent haul, so uh, I'm expecting a lot more off this field. I'm expecting you know, into three figures on that one there, you know, over 100,000. And then uh, we've also got field 48, which again, you can see, is a big field, bigger than 45. So uh, probably pushing three figures on that one as well you know the hundred thousand range on that field too so looking like we're going to make a lot of soybeans from this year's harvest which is fantastic news so our guys are going to take a quick break for lunch while they're doing that i'm going to head over to the livestock market and uh, from there we'll uh, we'll look at some cow prices we'll check out the the uh, you know the meat that's being auctioned off so to speak and uh, and see where we go from there whether we are going to jump straight into cows or whether we hold back until next year all right so the dealership is just here The auction uh, auction house for the livestock. So let's just park up here out of the way. And uh, let's uh, pop in. Actually, uh, we can't get in through that door, I wasn't sure. Uh, let's uh, take our seat and uh, let's check out the livestock. So the auction is over. Unfortunately, we didn't find any livestock that we wanted to purchase. The prices were just a little too high. We're currently being quoted over $5,000 per cow, uh, which is a little too pricey for me. We kind of missed the window a little bit. If you see here, the price for cows was a bit lower a few days ago, but it started to climb back up, obviously, it was at its really lowest midsummer. So it looks as though we're going to kind of hold off on uh, on getting cattle because it's just too expensive a time of year. Obviously, the price guide that we have here in the economy is wrong. 
you know, these prices are not accurate, but they are giving uh, an impression of the trend of where the prices were, even if the actual value of the prices is not accurate. So we still get a good idea as to exactly how much we could be paying and how much we are potentially going to be paying later, you know, uh, in the sort of purchase cycle. So we're going to hold off until next summer, really, for cattle, you know, having looked at that. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, it gives us time to, uh, to really finalise getting all that equipment that we're going to need in and not pay over the odds for quick deliveries and we can take our time and we can find the right equipment at the right price and then we can get the cattle at the right price as well so we're going to head back to the farm the uh, the workers are already back in action on our fields you know they had a very short break between fields but they are harvesting away on field 49 for us while we've been here at the auction house so uh, the harvest is continuing I just because I'm, we've got a lot of harvesting still to go I wanted to give them a short break in like a little half an hour break just to stretch their legs and uh, uh, and grab a quick drink at the uh, at the farmhouse so they're well and truly back underway and we'll go rejoin the action and uh, and get back involved in the harvest now that we've done our, our little foray over at the auction house and realize that cattle is just too expensive at the moment for us to get into we can see the trees here changing color as the season changes this map really does look very very pretty in autumn well it looks pretty all the year round really <laughs> but uh, driving through here with these trees oh it's it's lovely i mean just look at these uh, look at this view as we drive through here with these uh, sort of orangey brown trees and the sunlight just poking through them in places it very, really is very very pretty indeed so yeah Let's get back to the harvest and uh, rejoin our workforce. We have finished spreading the digestate on the field. As you can see, we're just overflowing into our uh, uh, Joskin spreader at the moment, just to top it back up. Now that's done, let's do the front tank as well. Uh, that is already done, so there we go. We have... Uh, a completely full system here. That truck is now going to go back to Gavco's BGA. And uh, we can put this away. We're not going to uh, slurry spread our uh, wheat field. It's uh, going to be a little bit too... A little bit too time consuming. So uh, we'll get all this gear parked up. And uh, we'll get that put away a little bit later. But as I say, we need to rejoin the harvest. So uh, you can see one of our helpers has almost got a full grain tank. Let's uh, quickly jump up there. Kind of circle through. There he is. So you can see that they have made some progress already. Let's go tag this guy before he gets to the end of the field. I've put a headland in on both ends of the field as well, just to give us a little bit of turning room. One, so we don't go into... Uh, another farmer's field and two at the other end so we don't go into our own soybean crop on our uh, field 48 and, and potentially damage that as well so uh, the tricky bits of the field are done the headlands and the bit around the lone oak itself it's now just a nice straightforward up and down on this field to get everything done and the combine can do two complete passes before it needs to be emptied again so uh, that's uh, that's all good we don't have to worry too much about that just need to uh, to bring it all in now okay so we're going to actually put some poplar down on our other field our barley field that we harvested uh, uh, yesterday and we can see that the trigger is actually uh, quite improved on what it used to be it used to be that this trigger you know, had to be a lot closer to this building. Now, this was part of the update, if you remember. We had, um, you know, listed in the update log was the ability, well, was, you know, improved fill triggers for the fertilizers. Now, I haven't checked out the sprayer one. I suppose we could quickly do that now, actually. Let's take a quick look and see just how improved the sprayer trigger is, because this is pretty much empty and I have no doubt that at some point we may well have to uh, use our sprayer again but we can at least have a look and just put a splash in so we had to be right up against that wall previously 
and you can see here look how far away we are now and we're still able to actually put fertilizer in you know whereas before if we want if we wanted to you know use the liquid spray tanks we had to be sort of here to be able to actually do it and any further away and we were kind of right on the very border of whether we could actually use those triggers or not so those triggers have definitely been improved it's great to see uh, it makes it a little bit easier to refill our fertilizers let's just park, <coughs> park this back up here so yeah we're going to go and park uh, we're going to go and park we're going to go and plant some poplar on the barley field uh, so we don't have to mess around too much with that field actually just go out this way close the lid there we go We'll do this. We've got the workers still uh, ploughing away, or still plodding away, harvesting the soybean. We're going to go into the night, and we're going to do all three soybean fields tonight. So it could be a very, very late finish. If that happens, obviously, we'll probably run out of time on the episode, and I'll give you a, a kind of a final total tomorrow as to just how much we pulled off the field. But uh, I'm going to uh, plant some soybean, some some oilseed radish, you know, a cover crop on this field here and hopefully this will be ready to cultivate before winter hits. We've got time, I think, for this to grow through and if not, we can always, you know, scrub it off. If, if it might not even grow, as I say, it might be a case of it, it doesn't grow until spring. If that's the case, then we won't be able to put barley on this field. But if we can get this ready to, for the start of spring, um, then that'll be uh, a nice little time saver for us. Uh, and then I'm not sure what we'll do with the uh, with the bar with the soybean fields. I guess we'll just have to leave them as they are and spray those fields uh, in between. Yeah, you know, once they've been planted next year. Making some pretty good time here on this former barley field, as you can see. I'm doing the uh, the planting manually to try and save a little bit of cost in terms of wages got my cruise control set to 12 which is the same speed as uh, the operating speed of our cedar so that when we are in these sort of turns at either end of the field you know it's much easier to control the turn if you're going uh, at the same speed all the way through nice and constantly there's no sudden lurch forward and acceleration when you get to the end of a row and you lift the cedar up it just stays a nice constant speed so uh, that's a little kind of uh, Jim Bob's top tip for you there. If you like doing your manual seeding, when you know if you set your cruise control at the same as your operating speed, when you do get to the end and you lift the seeder, you don't suddenly lurch forward as your cruise control accelerates up to your top speed, or you accelerate up to whatever cruise control is set at. You keep a nice constant speed, and it makes it so much easier to make the turns. Uh, you'll see you know, a an example of that as we get to the end of the field just here so <clears throat> slightly uh, awkward because I've got this angle to work with but you can see there able to make the turn nice and smooth nice and controlled because I kept my cruise control set to my operating speed and now I can just run straight back down here and it just makes everything nice and smooth and continuous. Coming up to the last patch of this field, everything else on this field has been done now, as you can see. All completely harvested, uh, sorry, completely seeded. It's just this thin patch left. It's taken a bit longer to do than I thought. Uh, it's getting later in the day. We still haven't quite finished harvesting away on field 49 you can see the worker is right near the end of the field now it's got just a couple of passes left now I am going to uh, work into the night to bring that harvest in but we're going to save uh, field 48 for tomorrow I was looking at getting it done today but I'm looking at the radar and we've got really good weather tomorrow we've got good enough weather on Wednesday Thursday the final day of the season is when we're looking at the at the bad weather so we have time and we don't have to worry about wet crops when it comes to our corn because we're not going to be harvesting that we're going to be chaffing that so that's all going to go into a silage bunker now the upshot of that means 
two things. One, that we're going to have plenty of silage next summer when we do actually start moving into livestock. And two, we can actually sell off those additional 24 silage bales that are here on the farm parked up on the trailer which is just in front of us just coming into shot there it is so we can actually take those to the BGA tomorrow and we can sell those as well because we're not going to need those now we're going to have uh, as I say plenty of silage in our bunker which is the other side of this silo uh, there there's our bunker we'll fill that up with silage uh, from our cornfield well cornfields because we've got two of them uh, and we'll make sure that we have uh, a ton of silage ready to go next summer when we do bring cattle in. So we don't need those bales anymore. That's going to free up more space and a bit more cash for us, which is always a good thing. Uh, so let me just quickly jump over to our combine. See, this is all that's left on this field. So we're going to keep working away, bring this field in. Uh, and then when that's done, we're going to pack up for the evening and we'll start really early in the morning, uh, probably probably around four or five in the morning, and we'll attack the remaining soybean field that we have. We'll get that done, bring that in, see how much soybean we have in storage in total once all that's done. In fact, I'm going to take over manual control and finish this. There we go. Save a little bit more money on wages. Uh, so we'll get all of that done and then we'll start chaffing corn tomorrow and then Wednesday we'll start attacking the grass and we'll do our final cuts on the grass fields. Um, we'll probably do one cornfield tomorrow and we'll save the last one until Thursday so that we've, uh, we've got more time to play about with other things. Um, we're going to need our trailer for both you know, the soybean field and the corn field. So we can't do those both at the same time. So tomorrow we'll be doing uh, soybean harvest and then a chaff harvest on one of the two corn fields. Uh, and then uh, we might start on a little bit of the grass work. We might start making some hay bales tomorrow. We'll certainly probably have to weed our remaining grass field over by the sheep tomorrow, get that up to stage three. And then Wednesday we'll look at doing you know our proper grass cutting and uh, make a final batch of silage bales do what we can to uh, really maximize some money on that who knows with sheep prices being probably the lowest point in the year at the moment it's just over three thousand dollars we may possibly even invest in a few extra sheep uh, to go through over winter i don't know we'll see how that goes anyway that's it from me uh, it's another episode of lone oak coming to a close and uh, tomorrow we'll find out just how much soybean we've been able to harvest. So thanks for watching. I'm Jim Bob and I'll be back with the next episode of Lone Oak Farm very soon.